You are listening to Seismic Radio, and um, we are we are looking at the Book of Romans at the moment. And uh, let's have a look at the uh, next verses in our uh, Book of Romans, chapter eight, verses eighteen to twenty-five. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. <clears throat> okay, um, let's have a look at, at the scripture here uh, in Romans 8. Um, first of all, Paul talks about sufferings. Yeah, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And um, if you have listened to me uh, a lot, maybe you haven't, but one of my, uh, I think the term is pet hates, I don't want to use the word pet hates, but dislikes or... Um, things which kind of stir me a little bit, or quite a bit actually, is uh, is when people take the Bible out of context and uh, they preach something which is not really in the Bible. So we've got all the prosperity gospel preachers, we've got all the brigade. All they tell you is you should concentrate and focus on your money, <clears throat> get lots of it and then give lots of it to them as well. And that's what Christianity is all about. That's pretty much the impression you get. Obviously it's, it's, it's not quite as uh, uh, straightforward as that, you know, they dress it up in some nice, uh, you know, pious, religious, Christian mantle. But uh, if you sort of peel off the layers, um, it doesn't take very long. And then that's the core message, what you find. It's not about serving God. It's not about worshiping God. It's not about reaching out to God. It's not about your will be done as it is in heaven, so on earth, so in your life as well. But it is about something else. And... Um, but they never talk about they never talk about the sufferings. You know? And again, if if I look at Paul's life, when, we, when you look in the book of Acts, his life was just like one continuous suffering. He had some physical conditions which uh, the Bible or some scriptures in the New Testament suggest that he was almost blind. You know? uh, when we look at uh, church history and at, at um, you know what Paul was, he wasn't like this great standing upright man. He was like a little hunch hunch hunched over little character. So he wasn't like, a, um, you know, this great guy to look at, but uh, he was one of the greatest minds, or he was the greatest mind, I'm sure, of his time. And um, and, and one thing we know as well is that, that people tried to kill him several times. He was shipwrecked several times. He was imprisoned many times. And, and that was pretty much all his life, you know, just uh, you know, trying to do the right thing and uh, and and get, getting it in the neck for it. And and that was Paul. And when he says I, that he doesn't consider the sufferings of this present time that they are not worthy to, compa- to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, um, there's actually some substance to his, to it. He knew what suffering was all about. He he had it, you know, uh, himself many times over. Um. Again, so the point I'm trying to make is if you encounter as a Christian in your life sufferings, um, don't let it, you know, irritate you. It, it's part of it. It's part of being a Christian. Things go wrong. Um, the world hates us. It's uh, opposed to us. It tries to destroy us. And sometimes we get caught up in the battle. And uh, it's like in Paul's case, he was stoned several times and left for dead. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sure it's not a pleasant experience when this when this happens to you. And it might be the same with us as well, that uh, you're going to be made redundant, unemployed, you may lose your job, um, people deceive you, they give you a hard time, they are violent against you, 
Um, it's all part and, part and parcel of, of what we're going through here on earth. Uh, but our promises, they go further. They start here on earth, but they go into eternity. And that's, that's the perspective we have to have, you know, as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. There are promises in our lives God has made, and they start now, and they, they go to eternity. Some of it they get fulfilled here, but, but some of it will, will get fulfilled later. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's a very theological statement here. For the earnest expectation of the creation. Now, creation is in turmoil. And uh, even if you go to secular scientists and you, you ask them, you know, what is going on in nature, what is happening, and, and there are so many things we see. We see that... Um, that there's turmoil all the way around. Uh, for example, I was recently doing a study of sinkholes. It's something which we didn't see. Or when I was uh, a kid, you sometimes heard about landslides or erosion, um, but you never heard about sinkholes. And then suddenly, about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, you started hearing stories of, of massive sinkholes just appearing, you know, in the middle of cities and towns and fields, um, lakes appearing where there wasn't a lake before and, and things like that. So, it sort of seems to suggest that something is going on here. Uh, latest one I heard that there was a huge sinkhole somewhere in Russia. Doesn't really affect anybody, but uh, there was a mountain before. Suddenly there was a sinkhole. You know, the mountain just or parts of the mountain just disappeared. And, and I'd seen it, and it, you know, people were quite perplexed by it, and they they wondered what is going on, what is happening. So, um, like here, we get a statement, and it says that. Um, uh, um, later on in the text, I'm just looking for it, uh, we, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with burst punks together until now. So this is groaning and this labor going on. Also, what else is, is going on? We, we can see that this, this is from a Christian perspective, that, that creation is cursed. As we go through time, we see that the number of species is getting less and less and less, um, that uh, every... Every couple of years, we, we hear about another species which has gone extinct. And we also see that the variety of, of vegetation is, is getting less and less. So um, areas which used to be you know pleasant lands uh, with lots of vegetation turn into deserts. I think the only place where, where we get the reverse is actually in Israel. But that's uh, very often due to a lot of work and a lot of labor irrigation and so on to turn the, the desert back into, into green land. Um, okay, let's, let's go back to the text. Uh, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And our creation is waiting for us. Um, we know when we look at eschatology and when we look at what the Bible is projecting into the future, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the old things have passed away. And the new heaven and new earth will be in perfection. So, um, and, and, and again, I I'll make often I make this point and I say, if we look at creation now and if we look at nature, it's, it's a fantastic place. There's uh, you know, lots of self-healing mechanisms in nature. There um, is a lot of uh, glory, you know, which you can see in nature, where um, you know you look at flowers and you look at other things as well, and, and you can see that um, th that there is something really beautiful and really, amaz really amazing in nature, which has got the signature of God written all over it. But but then on the on the other side, we see um, the uh, the issue of corruption as well, and we see uh, the issue of nature being fallen. Um, and um, okay, we, we're going to go on, and not only that, but we also, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Um, if you are young, it probably uh, might not really dawn on you, and you think, yeah, my body is great, you know, everything is super. Uh, I, I would say there's a good chance that there are some some issues, but once you get over a certain age, once you uh, get in your uh, 40s, 50s, or, or older still, you actually realize that your body is decaying. It's, um, 
it's getting less and less. So your teeth, they suffer. You uh, start having problem with your joints. Um, your hair goes out. If you're a woman um, in your 20s and 30s, you might be... Um, uh, you, you you will be extraordinarily beautiful, but then suddenly, once you hit your 40s, this beauty sort of starts fading away more and more until uh, you look in the mirror and you don't like what you are what you are seeing anymore. So the perfection, you know, the great things, the glory of man, you know, the the strength of man, just wanes away, and and you come to the conclusion uh, you need redemption. You know, some people, and I think it's quite interesting as well, when you look into the cosmetic industry, they, they try, they look for redemption in cosmetic surgery. And uh, so we've got all the, the Botox mania, uh, we've got uh, facelifts and, and all sorts of other stuff where people try to give themselves like another lease of, uh, I wouldn't say lease of life, lease of beauty or lease of, uh, you know, being more attractive. And and to some extent it does work, but then on the other extent it uh, it's a battle you'll not win. Eventually, your body is gonna uh, go downhill more and more and more. Um, I find it interesting. I heard a comment recently about Hollywood, where um, when people do castings, they um, they start complaining because so many people they are bo- they are so botoxed up in their face that they don't have real facial expressions anymore. But huge parts of the faces are just numb, um, and they, there's no expression in there. And they can't really use them for the films they want to use them for. So they might be uh, looking very pretty on a photo, but uh, when they move about and uh, you know they can barely, they might be able to get a smile with their mouth, but their, the eyes don't smile anymore. That's, that's all gone, and it's it's actually it's turned into a problem within the uh, the acting industry in in Hollywood and places like that. Uh, which I find quite distressing in a way that um, values have been so externalized for for people that you know what you see and what you present is is all that counts. What is behind the real you, the real person, has sort of stepped into the background and doesn't count that much anymore. It's it's a sad state of society. That's that's what I think. Okay, so um, we need redemption and we need adoption and. We know that uh, when we are with the Lord, um, that we will be redeemed. And, and the Bible talks about that when the trumpet blows, um, that the dead in Christ will rise fir- first, and then we who are left over here will be taken up to be with the Lord. And, and that's when you know those who are in heaven will be united with their bodies. And if you are here, you'll be taken with your body, and you'll be taken to be with the Lord. And and that's really the redemption, you know? The redemption. I mean, I can only speculate, but I'm sure if you've got rotten teeth, uh, I just lost a filling this morning or half of a filling, I know that my teeth are going to be perfect and that I don't have to worry about fillings. And I know that uh, my receding hairline is going to be back as well and uh, that my beard that's whitening in certain places will be back too. I know that my body is going to be in the best possible condition uh, as it is resurrected, and that is not sort of uh, a half, a half-hearted effort, you know, <coughs> full of corruption, disease, joints uh, which don't work properly, or uh, leg that's too short, or, or whatever it may be. You know? But but we will be raised with perfect bodies, and we will be, um, we will have our own glory. To, to use this term, your body will be looking fantastic. Uh, if you're a woman, you'll be looking fantastic. If you're a man, um, there won't be any shortfall in your body. And that is something which is, you know, something we look forward to. And the older you get and the more you realize the frailty of your body you've been endowed with, uh, the more you're looking forward uh, to that. And I'm sure when I, when I look at Paul who has written this, you know, he, he had problems reading because his eyesight was failing him. Church history, church history seems to suggest that he was, uh, you know, he wasn't like a great, tall, strong, powerful man, but he was sort of very, um, sort of very ordinary, you know, a bit hunched over, <coughs> seemingly a bit of a weakling, but, um, you know, not like something marvelous, pleasant, great to look at. But, but you know, I'm sure he was one of the greatest speakers at the time. 
And he, well, he must have been a great person. Uh, I mentioned this in the last talk as well. Uh, there's one instance in Acts uh, where where Paul mentions that uh, uh, as one story actually that is written in one of the epistles where anyway Paul mentions that if um, when he said goodbye to them if they could could have ripped all their eyes to give them to him they would have done so because of the love they had for him so I would imagine if if Paul was at home at your place um, and he would talk to you you would just have a good time you would really enjoy his presence being there. Uh, if there are things not quite right in your life, he would, you know, point his finger on them and help you to straighten yourself out before God. But but he would be a really nice guy to hang around with, and uh, and he would sense a deep love, compassion, uh, and uh, and greatness that's 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 there within him. So that's the Apostle Paul I'm talking about, and I'm sure that that would be the case. But anyway. Um, we are waiting for the adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. Um, and we were saved in this hope, and then he makes a statement about hope, and he says, hope that is seen is not hope, uh, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait f- for it with perseverance. Now, our, f- our faith um, is based on on trusting, on placing trust in Jesus Christ against all the odds against all logic sometimes. I mean, I can come to you and I can probably make an argument uh, that the Word of God is divinely inspired. And I can sort of go through a bunch of scriptures and stuff like that. You might take it on board, you might not take it on board. Um, but, But ultimately, it comes down to one thing, and that is just this blind trust in Jesus Christ, that He has died for you, that He has done everything on the cross of Calvary, that uh, He is waiting for you to come to him and that he can he can and that he will give you eternal life in the presence and the glory of God and uh, and that takes sometimes a lot of faith but it's, it's not so hard on the other side either um, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit uh, the Bible even says that that faith is a gift of the Spirit and uh, and there's something which which God will create inside of you all you need to do is just reach out to it and then things will fall into place by themselves, you know, step by step by step. So I want to encourage you, and I want to really encourage you to embrace this hope we've got in Jesus Christ, and to persevere in this hope as well, and to wait for the adoption, and to wait for the redemption of your body, and for the adoption of being a child of God. I mean, people look at you, people look at me, and there's nothing, you know, glorious to look at, I'm not a guy who, uh, you know, I could, couldn't go out there in the world and I could say, look at me, how fantastic I am, and all the things I've done. Of course, I haven't done any, and I'm not fantastic, and I'm not, uh, uh, you know, uh, a great piece to look at either. But, uh, but I've got a hope, and this hope is in Christ, and this hope, I'm sure, is not going to disappoint me. And that is what I can pass on to other people as well, and I can tell people about this hope in Jesus Christ, and encourage them to embrace the same, so that they can look forward to an eternity in fellowship with God. Okay, let me sum this up. Um, now, Paul talks about sufferings, and that's quite a bit of a, of a, I don't know, in, in our century, in our, you know, um, should I say, in, in our generation defiled by Christian television. There's some good Christian television, don't get me wrong, and I really enjoy it and I appreciate it. And there's, there's some really good, encouraging stuff but there's also a lot of bad stuff which gives you a wrong idea about who God is and what the Word of God has to say. And and we need to be very careful. I want to encourage you, you know, when you, when you sort of try and embrace the faith in Jesus Christ, faith in God, to, to read your Bible and to seek God whilst you're reading your Bible and to look and measure everything against the Bible. No, the Bible doesn't talk to you and it doesn't tell you that you come to Christ and everything is, um, you know, glorious. On the contrary, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Yeah. If he suffered, you will suffer also. Yeah. This is no question about it. When you, when you look at the first apostles, so all apostles apart from John um, were executed you know, in proclaiming the faith. And John was in prison in Patmos. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I always imagined, you know, he was on this lovely Mediterranean island. 
you know, overlooking in a little house because they put him into exile, so they probably just shut him away somewhere and he was sitting in this little house with a little veranda and, um, you know, just <clears throat> doing his stuff and writing the book of Revelation, writing the Gospel of John and, and so on. The reality is probably more like it. He was in a, in a labor camp, which was probably more like a gulag or a concentration camp but the Romans got all the uh, undesirables of the empire and they put him to work. And uh, he probably in his old days, he was uh, probably working in a quarry. He was doing a lot of stuff. And uh, I sometimes wonder whether he wished he would have been martyred instead. Uh, but instead he uh, he had to hang out there for many, many years and uh, was writing up you know bits of paper and tried to uh, manage to smuggle them out. So that, uh, you know, people could read them. So, that was no f- pleasure, that was no fun for these guys, you know, as they went out to proclaim the gospel. It's not like today where you've got big fat preachers running around in expensive cars and expensive suits and, uh, you know, finding confirmation of their calling in, you know, the financial success and the financial harvest they are taking in. So I'm not sure about that. I, I want you to be very, very careful when you meet these guys. Whatever these guys are saying, measure it up against the Bible. Measure it up against the Word of God. Now here, we have got uh, Paul talking about sufferings. And he says, you know, whatever sufferings I'm in and what we are in. And I would go so far that we all, in some instance or another, we suffer and we are dealing with sufferings. I mean, one big attack I see in the modern church is, That because morality is so far, far, far away from the, from the truck, you know, from where we should stand. I mean, I, I go back to my mum's and to my uh, my parents' generation. So I'm in my, I'm close to being 50. So if you go to my parents' generation, you're looking at people who were born in the Second World War, just just around about that time before or shortly after. So when I look at that generation, and that's one generation before me, for example, divorce, uh, sexual immorality, anything like that was virtually unheard of. Yeah. It did happen, but it didn't happen very often. Uh, then I go one generation further. That's my generation. Um, a lot of my friends and contemporaries I know, they are divorced. And it just seems to be now a stage in life. So you go through life, you know, you, you stick with your wife for so long, and then things get a bit tough and a bit sticky, <clears throat> and, um, and people split up. Yeah. That's, that's what seems to be the norm. Uh, also, as far as morality is concerned, it, it's just rampant. Uh, stuff which was unheard of uh, I mean literally when you go back to my father's generation or maybe a little bit before if somebody was caught with uh, um, with uh, his daughter in bed you you had the father picking out a gun and taking both of them to church to get married there and then and have it all done and dusted so um, um, that was pretty much the mentality people had in, in those days and it's all totally changed it's all totally different now that we are totally free and, and so on uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not glorifying the old times. They were not that much better than our times. There were a lot of things which went wrong, but there was a sense of morality. There was a sense of doing right. Um, there was a sense of doing business right. You didn't cheat. You paid your taxes. You um, tried to be honest, you know, as best as you could. You tried to do the right thing all the way through. And, and that was pretty much what uh, what that generation was all about. Yeah. And... And when I look at, at our generation, at our current generation, um, it's totally different. Totally, totally different. And I've lost the point I'm trying to make. Um, let me just go back to the text. Okay, uh, I'm back. So the point I'm making is, sufferings we may have in our generation is not um, sometimes that much an attack of persecution, but it's an attack of immorality on our lives. And whether we want to or not as Christians, we are impacted by the world around us. And uh, sometimes, you know, people, uh, you know, with fidelity or infidelity or, uh, you know, spouses breaking up and so on, uh, it may just be because that's what's in this world considered to be normal, that's considered to be the norm of things. And so sometimes we suffer because we get caught up uh, with the standards of this world, you know, into our lives. And uh, it's a big problem. It's a big problem, I think, in our day and age. The sufferings are there. Uh, same with our kids as well. Uh, there's so many temptations out there where our kids uh, are likely to get sucked into stuff which isn't good. 
stuff which was unheard of a generation before. So I look at some of these computer games and I look at uh, some of the kids I come across. And if you take the computer away from them, it's, it's a worth thing. They're totally addicted to computer games, to particular games. And if they don't have them, they go ballistic. Um, so uh, completely different set of things. But uh, again, whatever these kids are getting up to is not good. It's not good for their development. It's not good for uh, their relationship with God. And uh, and we have to deal with these things uh, as as parents and as uh, as adults to to deal with them. It's stuff which we never had before, really, to that extent. Maybe similar things, but 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 not not what we are dealing with today. Okay, so the point I'm trying to say is there's suffering in this world. There's, if you are a Christian, you will have sufferings. There's no doubt about that. And if you have sufferings, don't you think that you know God has gone against you or something has really uh, gone wrong? Uh, if you have got suffering, it's just part and parcel of being a Christian. If you're not a Christian, um, you will have sufferings too. The worst thing is you will have no way out. Uh, the only way out is in this world, and very often it's full of deception and lies, and it doesn't really get you anywhere. But uh, when you walk with God, you've got hope in God that God is going to take you out of your suffering, and uh, he's going to take you into into a new dimension, into a dimension of uh, knowing him, walking with him, and conquering problems and, and issues together with him. And, and that is something very amazing. Uh, okay. Um, I'm summarizing, and I'm probably spending too much time on the summary here. Um, we talked about hope. Uh, creation itself, you know, creation is on the way down, and that's something which we can see. If you look, even if you look at natural history, if you take the data the scientists present to us, they interpret it in a different way. But if we look at them, we can see it's going downhill. Everything is going downhill. And so creation was subjected to utility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we are looking at creation. Creation is in bondage of corruption. So that means... Um, it's it's doomed, yeah, doomed to go down here. The same as your body is doomed. Uh, uh, being part of this creation, your body is the day you are born, you're doomed to die. And there's no ifs and buts. Um, you're going to pick up, you're going to develop, you're going to reach your peak when you're 25. And then from that point on, it's just going to go down here. Interestingly, uh, I find it quite quite fascinating. Apparently, the brain doesn't go down here. Your brain will develop further and further. So if you keep your brain busy you will uh, have more capability as you grow older. Uh, A lot of people don't keep it busy, or they keep it busy with the wrong stuff, and obviously it goes downhill as well. But apparently that's the only thing which you can keep active to uh, old age unless uh, some genetic problems like Alzheimer's or other stuff kicks in. Um, Okay, and finally we've got... um, groans and labors of with birth punks together uh, until now. So um, there are birth punks and there are groans in, in creation, and we can see this. So I, I was quickly talking about sinkholes, about all the stuff that's going on there. And we can see there's something not quite right. You know, the earth is groaning. Um, when I look at, I, I used to still do it a little bit. I used to uh, look at the seismic data every day. And it's sometimes interesting what you see where, you get uh, uh, earthquakes coming up in certain regions of the world. Uh, Iceland is quite bad. And there was some one instance, one region where, or one place where you hit about 200 earthquakes a day. So, I mean, I would imagine if you are there, I, I, the earth is probably pretty much shaking all day long. And uh, it lasted for so long and then it just stopped. And uh, I don't think there's been anything recently. But... Um, but that's literally, I mean, the earth is literally groaning when you look at these earthquakes, when those tectonic plates are pushing into one another. Um, and um, and again, you know, creation, we, everybody is waiting for redemption. And we are, hoped, we are saved in this hope, and, and this hope is something which keeps us going, uh, even though we can't see it. But uh, we hope for it in perseverance. So that's that's really what Paul is saying. Uh, hope will not disappoint us, that's for sure, if we place our hope in the right things. Now, if you place your hope in God, uh, your hope is not going to disappoint you, but it's going to keep you going. Okay, I'm going to close at this point. Um, 
This was Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. Uh, thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch, info at seismicradio.org. And uh, the um, uh, website is www.seismicradio.org. Thanks for listening. God bless and bye-bye.